On behalf of employees at Facebook, I would like to welcome Rajiv Malhotra ji. Rajiv ji is a well-known researcher, author, speaker, and a public intellectual on civilizations, cross-cultural encounters, religion, and science. Today, he will be speaking on Vedic consciousness and its relation to modern technology. Rajiv ji. Welcome and th thank you for uh, uh, inviting me here and, and uh, namaste and welcome to all the viewers around the world, whoever is watching. It's my first visit to uh, Facebook headquarters here in Menlo Park. I'm very excited after this event, they promised me a campus tour, which will be exciting. And so this uh, event uh, we'll do in three parts. First two parts will be live on the internet for everybody to watch. And the third part is private for the audience that is sitting right here in the room, which is Facebook employees only. So I will give uh, some introductory remarks on the concept of what I have to say. And then there are questions which the moderator will ask me, which have come on the internet. Come on the internet, both in my page and Facebook page and other people have sent questions. So these questions I will answer. And then we will cut off the live link so sorry all you guys, you will be cut off, but I'll be interacting with the people in the room right here. And that would be a different kind of interaction. So I, <clears throat> most of my life, I have zigzagged between two realms. My personal practice and philosophy and pursuit in life, being philosophical, practicing consciousness techniques of various kinds and philosophically trying to understand using physics and consciousness and Vedic th thought and so on. And the other part has been as a technocrat, like you guys, starting uh, before many of you were born uh, in the 70s and uh, in the t IT field. At that time, um, it was called DARPANET and then it became ARPANET and then the government called it Internet and that's what we have here. So I've been into this for a long, long time and I have been asking these philosophical questions. I don't have all the answers, but these are very important questions to ask. So I've been asking these for a long time. I have a few notes that I'm going to uh, make sure that I cover uh, important issues. <clears throat> so there are two kinds of interconnectivity. There is one idea in the realm of consciousness and spirituality, and then there is another one in the, con in the realm of material, you know, computing, the world of matter, the internet, the world that you guys are in. So the question is whether the idea of consciousness interconnectivity will, is powerful enough, because it's explained in the Vedic tradition in a very powerful way, whether it's powerful enough to, co uh, to assimilate, to include the material network internet that's going on, take advantage of it, make it part of its own manifestation. That's one possible option. The other scenario is that the material interconnectivity evolves into AI and those kind of things. And what we call consciousness actually st has to fit into that. We become reduced as sort of leaves on a tree. It's the tree that is a material one. And we are sort of little nodes who are feeling, uh, supplying data, providing biometrics. And, and it's really the internet that's controlling us. I think there's a lot written on which is going to predominate. I think that we can unify the two. And that's what I'm going to talk about because I feel that our Vedic model has the concept of yantra, which means a mechanical device, a physical machine. So a yantra needn't be just a very simple, uh, you know, a simple device. It could be an airplane, it could be a car, it could be a computer, it could be an internet, it could be all sorts of things. We also have ideas of evolution of collective consciousness. For instance, Sri Aurobindo wrote a lot about the evolution of collective consciousness, which is not just one yogi at a time evolving his consciousness, but all of all conscious beings collectively evolving to a higher state and in, in, in such a way that there is a superhuman. There's a, there's a state of being which is as advanced compared to us as we are compared to, say, monkeys. So uh, like we think of monkeys, uh, that they don't get it, but they, are, they have so much similarity to us, maybe 99% of their genes and all that are similar, the DNA and all, but the same way that level of consciousness would see us as very limited beings. So there are, there are these kind of ideas 
and technology can play a role in facilitating that, perhaps even accelerating that. So I don't see technology being an enemy of spirituality. And I've see, I think that too many times these t things are put in conflict. That are you a spiritual person? Are you a material person? Are you, are you into mechanization? Are you into evolution of consciousness? I don't think that these are necessarily uh, incompatible. So I'm going to give you a few thoughts. The <clears throat> internet of computers is where the internet started. And now we talk about the internet of things. So it's not just computing devices, but light bulbs and car and dishwasher and you know, all kind of things could be connected. And you could have the internet of things. Of course, the bigger and broader the internet, the more vulnerable to hacking. So you also have that kind of an issue. But let's sort of put that aside for a moment. We'll come back to that. Uh, the Internet of Things is sort of the more advanced version of the early Internet. But what happens, how far can it evolve? You have communities, you have, uh, you know, relationships, you have so many kind of group, uh, group consciousness, group intelligence uh, in this. Facebook is a wonderful uh, example of how, that can, how far that can go. The question is, how far, how far can you take it with all the artificial intelligence, uh, maybe with quantum computing, uh, maybe with biological computing, where some of the computational devices are not silicon-based, but made, based out of, made out of uh, biological entities, and maybe they can be grafted into the person. So now you have a human being with computational devices in them. And so you have a human plus kind of uh, entity, being, and this is, the, this is a person who's walking around, doesn't need any external devices, connected all the time. I mean, you may have a day when, when, when there's an option when the child is born, they say, do you want that chip installed? It'll cost, you know, this much. Or maybe they'll say it's free because they'll send you free ads. They, they, they'll send you ads for the rest of your life. So you, you'd probably be in a bad shape if you took that option. But you could have either artificially grafted devices that make us all internet enabled as human beings, or you could have something where we evolve into that. Maybe, maybe there's a subtler way. Maybe there's a genetic mutation that happens where we have some kind of a computational enhancement going on. So one, one line of thinking is to take material world of computation and interconnectivity and see how far it can take you. How far, what is the extreme philosophically it can take you. Now, the thing is, no matter how sophisticated this internet becomes, this, this machine kind of internet becomes, you still have it relating to conscious beings outside the network. I mean, there is the network, and then there's people outside the network that are using it. You still have that. So you still have that edge, you know, when the machine meets the conscious being, the conscious being interacts, adds meaning, adds value, uh, is told what to do, and so on. You could go beyond language. Maybe there's no need to write anything. Maybe it's all recognizing your natural speech. Uh, you can do all those things. But at the end of the day, you still have that man-machine interface because there's a consciousness and mechan mechanical reality interface. But if you start, now let's put that in one side. Let's imagine there's another world, which is not synthetically putting together separate things. Internet is a synthetic unity as it exists. It's a unity of separately existing things that have been then put together. But they existed separately already. Now, in our Vedic philosophy, we have this concept of integral unity. Integral unity being that consciousness is inherently unified to begin with. It is not that we have to artificially bring things together. This is different than Western thought, where the unity is a synthetic unity. Things are existing separately, they have inherent self-existence, and they need to be put together in a unified way. So these philosophical systems start in different places. Now, in the Vedic metaphysics, where you start with a unified consciousness, but this unified consciousness includes structures, includes the laws of physics, what we call laws of physics, includes the potentials for manifesting into all sorts of ways. So, but it is inherently a unified entity. So from this unity, which I call integral unity, emerges diversity. So since no matter how much diversity there is, how many different kinds of 
beings and animals and plants and then matter and then silicon and then silicon gets uh, put back into computers. No matter how vast and diverse things get, there is a fundamental reality beneath it all which is unified. So this is a very different premise on the nature of reality. The idea of integral unity is a very fundamental concept we have which distinguishes the Vedic civilization from other worldviews. So what happens if you assume this to be the case? If you assume this to be the case, then, there, and then what follows from it, the rishis have discovered, which is how our tradition is based. The rishis have discovered states of consciousness where, where, which are available to everybody. It's not that God gave to some prophet a unique message and nobody else can, will get it. It's not history dependent and history limited. It's actually something available. It's called Satchitanand. So it's available to everybody. And it's a question of who is able to actually attain it, but it's available in principle to all persons. And therefore, and the discoveries of how to achieve these higher states of consciousness is what our gurus teach, what our different lineages teach, what the sampradayas teach. The whole systems of tantra and meditation, they're all about people being able to achieve that. And there's many methods, so different methods may work for different people. Now, if you evolve people in that way, and you don't need machines for that, you do not need mechanical devices for that, you achieve higher states of consciousness, and these higher states of consciousness exhibit, according to the Rishi and uh, you know, their statements, uh, these higher states of consciousness exhibit connectivity. So people are able to see what somebody else is thinking. People, uh, there, there is action at a distance. There is a remote causation. Uh, there is, uh, the cause effect is not just linear, but more complex than that. Yeah? So ideas we have of matter, space, time, break down or get superseded by other ideas in those states of consciousness. And these are not things that somebody wrote in one book sometime and we take it, believe it or that. These are constantly rediscovered in every period of history. In every century, there are people who found these things, who rediscovered it for themselves. So it's validated in the way empirical science validates claims. And therefore, there is some credibility to, to this. Also, what, is cred what makes this credible is that modern science, neuroscience, people who are doing research on yoga and meditation and so on, are validating many of the claims. Are, so some of the things are not just sort of a, a anecdotal, uh, take it at face value, Place, base it on somebody's, uh, you know, shraddha or, or trust for somebody, but actually empirically validated also. More and more uh, neuroscientific research using functional MRI and various other techniques on advanced meditators are finding things changing. The brain actually changes. Uh, I was watching something the other day. 30 days of regular meditation, the actual brain map changes. So this is pretty amazing. So it means that your exercises, your exercising certain kinds of consciousness capabilities actually has an influence on the hardware. It's this, it's your consciousness changing the hardware. So if that can happen, then many other things could also be possible. So these are the two paradigms. Now, what is happening today is that the mechanical model paradigm of a material world, computation, internet, connectivity, all of that, is more aggressive, faster growing, has more brains working in it, more resources, growing faster. And a very tiny portion of that much, uh, that much energy is being allocated to do research on the other model. And discoveries, so what we have is the, is the Western scientific model studying the consciousness, consciousness phenomena, many advanced yogis being studied, Buddhist, Hindu type yogis being studied, mapped, profiled, scientifically looked at what they can achieve. And then this is being put into a Western framework, a vocabulary, a new vocabulary is being created. So traditional terms are being lost. Now, and, and as a result of this happening over a long period of time, the Vedic tradition is getting digested into this new way of thinking. The integral unity is being digested and reformulated into a synthetic unity paradigm. 
So it is the harm being done is that a whole worldview, a whole vocabulary is being lost. You know, we are very concerned when a species is dead, but what about when a whole, when a word in a language dies and nobody even ever remembers what it means? There are many words, Sanskrit words in the Vedas that people don't really know what that means because we've lost the reference to it. So a loss of words, a loss of uh, uh, techniques for higher experiences is a loss of our collective human being, humanity's ecosystem. It is a loss of that because it's a shared ecosystem. It should be at least as much concern, if not more, as the loss of a, a an animal that's going extinct or a plant that's going to go extinct. So I'm concerned about that part of it. I'm concerned about not enough resource going towards uh, R&D of the Vedic worldview and the Vedic consciousness uh, science, you know. And, and uh, the collapse of the conscious uh, model, the consciousness model into a Western scientific model is happening at many levels. It's happening at a very rapid rate. Uh, many uh, transcendental meditation brought by Maharishi has been transferred into, tra uh, reduced into relaxation response by some people. Uh, yoga Nidra is lucid dreaming. Uh, vipassana is mindfulness. So a whole new vocabulary, new techniques. It's not just a question of doctoring up vocabulary to make somebody else famous as the pioneer. That's, of course, happening. More concerning to me is that the actual authenticity of what it means is being lost. So this is where new gurus are needed. New gurus emerge who revive all this knowledge, who bring it back to us and, re and take a give us a chance to go back. So I, I want to, uh, during Q&A also, I hope some of you will ask questions about uh, the synthetic unity model versus the integral unity model. And what is the harm being caused when the integral unity model, the Vedic model, gets broken apart, dissected, digested into the synthetic unity model, and the original disappears. That's a, that's a kind of an extinction, an extinction going on. I call that digestion. You get digested. So one of the examples of this is the category pran, pran as a level of being. Pran is a level of existence, a level of being, which is a central and necessary element of, be, of living, every living entity. So you could have the smartest robot, but it does not have pran. You could have the most intelligent drone, but it does not have the human pran. So you cannot have e-puja or e-yagna. You cannot have, you know, e-shraddha. You cannot say that I am going to, I am going to, uh, experience something through this internet because on my tablet I'm seeing the image as if I was sitting there in front of this deity and when I'm seeing this image it's going to have me the same effect. It's not going to have you the same effect because pran doesn't transmit through the, the these network. Pran doesn't go through this silicon uh, you know and, and so on. Pran is human consciousness state transmitted to another human consciousness state. It interacts in that way. Now, of course, there is some value if you look at a puja on a, on a tablet and you follow it because it suggests things to your mind and your emotions and evokes certain things from within you. But it's not like literally that transmission happening the way it would in a live contact. So we, we do lose something. Uh, so then the question comes, can there be, can pran be transmitted long distance? Can pran have its own network? Can there be a pranic hotspots? Can there be pranic hotspots so that you go somewhere and you log into this pranic hotspot using some mantra as a protocol? And is that what the Vedic technology is trying to get you? Is a, a different approach to consciousness, connectivity at a pranic level? So can there be a pranic network, pranic internet of some sorts? So I will, uh, I, I know that uh, we have, we have uh, to move on to, uh, uh, a question. So I will just go, make a few uh, few uh, statements. Uh, then we'll we'll go and take questions. The uh, the issue is not technology, but which side is controlling? Is it the mechanis me mechanistic uh, network controlling the conscious beings, or the other way around? 
when I go online and it's making too many default choices for me. And it's becoming more and more difficult to override the choices. And I'm finding it easier to just go along with it. I'm letting go of some free will. I'm letting go of some of my agency as a human being. It's soon going to decide what I like, what I will read, what I will eat, what I will buy, what, how I will think, what music I will read, or I will watch, I will, or I will hear. So the more I go into auto mode, the more the question, you have to ask this question, and we can discuss it uh, during the conversation. You have to ask the question, are we depleting our, our consciousness and becoming more automated? Because the system rewards us. The system gives me some points and says, okay, we'll send you this if you, if you keep clicking the default mode. So that to me is the issue. Are we losing conscious choice? Are we being conscious, making the choice the way our tradition teaches us that you, you become more and more conscious, you eat consciously, you walk consciously. So is, the, is our man-machine interface making us less conscious? That's, that's, I think, the issue. It's not the existence of these things. Now, I will, uh, I will uh, conclude by pointing out that I read somewhere that Zuckerberg went to Neem Karoli Baba's ashram. I think that was the ashram. He went to some ashram, Neem Karoli Baba's ashram. I went there also. It's near Al Mora in the mountains. And we had our first uh, Infinity Foundation uh, meeting to start a history of Indian science and technology way back in the year 2000. The first meeting we had was in that, in that area. So I remember that place. It's a beautiful place and it's a sacred spot. So according to the story that I read somewhere, Zuckerberg was in a confused state wanting some direction, wanting some new vision, some new uh, insight, creativity. So he goes to Steve Jobs, and Steve Jobs says, you go there and spend a month, and he spends the, spends the month. Now, not much is written on what exactly happened for the month. But there is a Zuckerberg Neem Karoli Baba moment in his life. And that moment is an important moment, in, he says, in his life. So maybe he tapped into this consciousness network of some sort. And maybe that manifested into this other network that he has. So with that thought, just as a speculative thought, I'll conclude and we'll get on with Q&A. Thank you very much. So the first question is, someone asks is, what role can technology play in revival of Sanskrit in India as a living language? So um, there are several things technology can do. Uh, there is computational linguistics, which is ironically Panini based, Panini grammar based, which allows machine translation. So I could speak in this language, you hear another language. Or I write something in this language, you read it out in another language. So one of the things that would enrich a language like Sanskrit is the availability of a lot of texts, a lot of new texts. Because you know, when you go and learn Sanskrit, you can only learn some old texts because new texts haven't been translated. I mean, newspapers aren't being translated, and what's happening on world news, and what did Trump and Hillary say is not going to come out to the Sanskrit guy right away. So he's depleted, and he feels deprived, and so he has to learn some other languages. If legal documents, science documents, management documents, more and more things could be translated into other languages, actually it would revive, technology would revive many languages that are facing trouble right now, not just Sanskrit. That's one aspect of it. I also think that... Uh, Technology can be used for distance learning, which we already are. And a whole lot of uh, organizations exist, like Sanskrit Bharati, that are teaching Sanskrit in local, in various places. And they can take advantage of some of these things. So I am for technology. I am not ever one of those guys who is sort of saying the spiritual path means you are against technology. Not even neutral to technology. I'm actually for technology. But I think if we are conscious of the issues, we can be more responsible. The next question relates to artificial intelligence. And uh, the question is, most of the AI systems rely extensively on collecting large amounts of data. For example, driverless car technology uses camera to collect ambient data and drive car from source to destination. In Ramayana, Ravana used the Pushpaka Vimana. Was Pushpaka a driverless, pilotless That's vehicle, or did it need someone at the <laughs> controls? 
See, I don't know this is the answer, but it's an amazing question. Whoever asked this is asking a very intelligent question. Uh, and we need to think about all that. That uh, is the future a rediscovery of the past? Uh, is the future uh, a kind of uh, another level of enhancement of what has been there? Not, it's not sort of going, we're not going back to the past. We are going forward to the future, but we're taking some of the things that already were there as a starting point. So we're, and you know, we don't know if Pushpak was a physical plane or in some kind of a virtual space. Maybe there's a world of virtual reality, and people are traveling in that virtual reality, and they have these virtual devices to travel. But it's a fascinating question. I don't know the answer. But Ramayan is silent on that, yeah. isn't that? He's very silent on that, that uh, on who, whether it's a driverless thing or not. Good, good observation. Another question is, from client server to distributed computing to Internet of Things, how does the Hindu paradigm of immanent divinity serve as a metaphor, help us understand the current unfolding of technology? Okay, very good. So to answer this, you're going to force me to reveal a term I'm coining in a book. And I was going to keep that for my book, but I think I'll mention it. I'm coining the term Internet of Beings. Okay, Internet of Beings. Uh, I, I have a book called Indra's Net. I think some of the books are there. Indra's Net is a metaphor from the Vedas, Indrajal. It is a net of interconnectivity of everything, all existence. People, not people, conscious beings, inanimate beings, in other words, everything that exists, every entity that exists is this Indra, Indra's Net. That's what it says. So this Internet of Beings is a very old metaphor. And I, I feel we need to do more research starting with these kind of ideas. We need to go look, dig deeper into how Indra's net is described and what I've described just a little bit in my book. We need to go and understand yantras. We need to understand the effect of mantras. We need to understand the technologies on which our tradition has been built. And, it, and we need to understand it with respect for that vocabulary. Rather than uh, trying to say, well, it must be the same as this, we, once we equate it, we translate it, then we feel we can get rid of the original. And that's what's happening, and we're losing that ecosystem. So my main message here is you need to protect that ecosystem and go back and study it in more detail because there's many more things to discover. So I would say this Internet of computers to Internet of things is moving towards Internet of beings, conscious beings. Makes sense. The third question, I mean, fourth question we have is, will the Sankhya school of philosophy, which explains how the world of ideas interacts with the world of things, make it easier to study consciousness as a scientific endeavor? Yes. Uh, Sankhya is probably the most uh, valuable model that I'm aware of uh, in, order to merge, in order to integrate the idea of conscious and matter. In order to, uh, because you know, one of the, what is called the hard problem in Western consciousness science is how does consciousness emerge? I mean, we can make things smarter, but AI is not conscious. AI just means that the machine can replicate the behavior of a conscious, intelligent person. That doesn't mean it is conscious, it is just mimicking consciousness. So, but what is actual consciousness? The, pers the se sense of I'm here the sense of being, the sense of feeling, experiences, all of that that comprises conscious. This is a very tough matter for Western models to accommodate. And so there are many, many theories. And then uh, denying the existence of matter as some kind of total illusion and all that is also not going to help us because that merely says there is no, don't, don't try to solve the problem because it, the problem doesn't matter. So it's like running away from the problem. The problem of, of the hard problem that we are trying to solve, of the relationship be, between these, dismissing it by saying it doesn't matter, ultimate reality doesn't matter, it's all mythia, it's all temporary and it's illusory, is kind of a cop-out. So I'm not satisfied with that. I think uh, Sankhya offers a, a good, uh, a good uh, approach to how differences are also integrated, how different elements, how different essences are also integrated, how they come together. So that's a nice... Uh, question. We should have more uh, 
specific brainstorms on particular, uh, particular subtopics. And I hope we can do that at some point, but at least we're opening the topic. Definitely. Another question says, many experts from computer sciences say more than 80% jobs will disappear in the near future. And this time it is going to be radically different from job losses in agrarian sector due to industrial revolution. We are already seeing that growth in GDP is being accompanied by proportionately and increasingly lower growth in employment than what we used to be before. My two questions are, do you agree with this prediction? If yes, what would be the right approach to solve the resulting social unrest, which has already started in many societies? Actually, it's a very brilliant question. Um, I worry for countries like India, which have not addressed the population growth problem. I really worry about it. And this business that uh, youth is a dividend, youth is a dividend in terms of they have arms and legs and they can work and they have brains, but they also have stomachs to feed. So it's an asset, it's also a liability. We are creating 20 million new, uh, 20 million new youth enter the job age every year, but not 20 million new jobs being created. So this has to, you, this can't just go on. Plus the planet cannot just go on feeding more and more people. There are limits to what you can do and other natural resources. And in any case, I think the quality of life suffers when you have ultra dense, high dense kind of places, you know, and we are getting there. So not only economic reasons of employing, how, how do you keep these people employed? But I think uh, environmental reasons, ecological reasons, uh, require that we, the humanity has to take care of this problem of population explosion. We love the Vedic model, but we should realize that in the Vedic era, there were probably no more than four or five million people all over in South Asia. Just that's it, four or five million people, maybe. Because, you know, in the Mughal era, it was 300 million. So you can go from 1.2 billion to three, 300 million, you know, one-fourth the size. That's just a few centuries ago. So you go back to earlier times and earlier times, probably India was all heavily forested and with a lot of agriculture and life and all that, not that many people. So there was a certain model of lifestyle. And that kind of lifestyle may not be sustainable when you have such a high density. So there are other reasons besides just GDP issue and unemployment issue which would create social unrest. My reasons for worrying about the population expansion are more than just that. But that is also valid. So I would say this requires uh, leadership and the reason leaders aren't willing to take to admit this problem is because it's unpopular. It's not a politically correct thing to say. The politically correct thing to say is everything is fine, you're doing great, that'll be somebody else's problem, I'll be dead by then, so I, right now we're doing okay. We're just pushing off, like in the United States, we're pushing off infrastructure because, you know, it'll cost, cost you money and the next generation will benefit, you know? So in India, we're pushing off these kind of things. I am worried about it, I really worry and I, 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 the answer to the first question is yes, I am convinced that uh, prior revolutions which increased efficiency created new jobs. So people say, we know, we'll have new jobs in the IT sector, in the tech sector. So Facebook will have tenfold employees and we are hoping that will be the case. We wish you well. But you see, no matter how much the tech sector grows, the point is even Facebook at some point in time will become automated. I mean, the, 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 there are always limits to what you can achieve. You can just look at the life cycle of IBM. You can look, it's a huge company for many years now, decreasing revenue every year. Huge company. Because a certain model, after a while, cannot just sustain growth. So, yes, we may be creating biotechnology and that will create jobs. We may be creating all sorts of things that will create jobs. But you see, some of those jobs will also be affected adversely by two, a whole lot of computing power and computing intelligence to manage those jobs without human beings or without the same number of human beings. More than just the quantitative shrinkage of jobs, I think the social problem will be a hierarchy of jobs with haves and have-nots in terms of who are really qualified in, in the high tech of IT. So those who are at the cutting edge of these kind of, syst of these ki this kind of knowledge uh, will probably be occupied. They'll probably have jobs. But those who are less will probably not have jobs. So you have two problems. One is an overall pr pressure on the environment and so on. And the second is a bigger discrepancy between 
those who can move, keep up with the latest technology and the job market and so on, and those who cannot. When I was your age, I was considered a software developer. Uh, software was not considered a profession at the time. If in a passport application or somewhere they asked you what's your profession and you wrote software, the guy would question what are you talking about. That's true. Okay? <laughs> it's not just a country, I'm talking about United States. It's not uh, uh, in look at all the government job categories not listed. I'm talking about going back in time. So you can see the excitement a person like me had at that time that, you know, I, we're going to develop all these things and uh, we'll automate and you don't need. We even talked about things like uh, programmerless. So, uh, we'll have a world without programmers very soon because we'll have written all the programs. I mean, we had all that. And I know that that's naive. I know that new jobs are going to be created. But I think we're reaching a time when the kind of new jobs that will be needed will be so sophisticated and so high, very concentrated uh, intelligence, concentrated wealth will happen as a result of that. So uh, some problems will come, and this is something to uh, address. It takes courageous leadership to do that. So we need to think about what majority of human beings will be occupied with. Yes, we should think about that. And in the Vedic model, uh, they should become meditators. They should help the evolution of humanity and evolution of consciousness. And if food can be grown by robots walking around and people have free time, and so if you can do all the GDP production without too much labor, then the human being should be put to some use, which is collective consciousness evolution rather than just indulgence and uh, crime and uh, those sort of things that will happen uh, unless you have a higher purpose. So there needs to be a... I think there is a deficiency in higher purpose in basic indoctrination in children. So we are a society of greed, and that may not be sustainable. But if you are a society of uh, lots of meditators with not that much consumer needs and consumer craving, then you, know, you might be able to have a bigger population and make them contented. I think we have time for one last question from the internet, and then okay. we'll open the floor for our employees. If biological computing and quantum computing becomes reality, could AI lead to artificial consciousness, the return of the rishis? I think this was from you. I wrote that, yes. Uh, I, that is actually uh, a book I'm working on uh, that maybe on the material side, we have AI going on. I was an AI guy also way back. And, you know, we thought we were going to solve all these problems, but now this AI has got solving bigger problems. And the trivial problems of playing chess and all that, which we thought is a big problem, is kind of solved. You know, it's boring today. So AI and quantum computing and biological computing and all these kind of things will take us to uh, systems that seem more conscious, more intelligent than anything we can imagine today, and maybe smarter than human beings in many ways. So once you have driverless cars, maybe you'll have very smart driverless cars that are better than human drivers. You, you very soon will have that. And when you have, once you've achieved a soccer player who's a drone, then you'll probably have uh, boring matches because these uh, drone soccer players will be so good that there'll be no human being able to match. So it'll be kind of boring. So you, you could have a world of that sort uh, going on. And I think at the same time, there's another revolution, which is the Rishi revolution which I have called the return of the rishis, that there are movements in many parts of the world, serious movements, serious sanghas, where the technologies of the rishis are being replicated and introduced. I have seen the third eye awakening, and it's an amazing technology. And rather than being cynical, rather than making fun, rather than sort of a, a quick dismissal, a scientific attitude is let's go investigate. Uh, uh, science doesn't say that uh, extraordinary things can't happen. Science says that it should be reproducible. So you should be able to reproduce it, not just saying it happened once, I can't show it to you again. It should be measurable. I should be, and you should be open that if it's falsified. I should be able to falsify it or validate it. And I think as long as these criteria exist, that the way science is advanced is through amazing uh, claims people have made that turned out to be true. Sometimes it turned out to be false. So this kind of... Uh, uh, new uh, interest in these extraordinary human potential, you know, potentials is happening all over the world. It's a very positive thing that's happening. And uh, people in uh, uh, Facebook should be very interested in that and try to 
invest in that and maybe maybe these are things that very big companies and visionary people like facebook would be able to help in that I thank agree. you thank so you are we concluding this section uh yes okay so i just want to say goodbye to all the guys on the internet watching uh, we are going to cut off the link and we're going to have a private continuation of this conversation with facebook employees right here in their headquarters in menlo park namaste and good night